Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, building robust systems uh, with console and in a more generic way how basically service discovery and configuration and having a good answer to those problems gets you quite a bit of the way to having uh, a, very, a very robust system without doing much more. So this talk is going to be primarily about console and not about the other things um, that I've done, but we're going to begin by taking a step back and kind of understanding the problems that uh, console solves or things like console solves and why they're so important. So not too long ago, um, not less than two decades ago, you know, most web service deployments looked something like this. Uh, you would have a node on top of the single node usually. Uh, you would just have a bunch of services and things were pretty easy. You knew things were on localhost, they were just on different ports, and it was pretty easy to make things work as long as you kept that one node alive. Very quickly after that, uh, virtualization kind of took over everything, um, gave us our clouds that we have today, and it started to look like this, where you have a hypervisor, you have multiple operating systems on top of that hypervisor, and then finally on top of those nodes, you have uh, more services, and, and things get a little bit more tricky in terms of where do I find these services and things like that. And now, very recently, it's gotten even more complicated as we introduce another layer where we're starting to put things into containers. Um, and sometimes, you know, containers don't require the hypervisor. They could go directly on machines, but generally they're used in clouds, which means you're on virtualization again. So uh, we're just adding more layers and more indirection, and it gets even trickier to find the things that we're looking for. And, you know, as time has gone on, we've uh, just gotten more and more services. So to make that even worse, realistically, the way this looks is actually like this, where you have this repeated you know, dozens of times or hundreds of times in order to make a realistic uh, infrastructure. And that's pretty much the state of modern ops. We're just getting more and more of everything. There's more servers, uh, there's more layers of indirection, there's more services, uh, more communication between the services, it's just more and more things. And this is introducing more and more problems. And uh, maybe they're not more problems, maybe there's new problems or exacerbating problems we've just uh, not really experienced before. But things are getting harder. And when I say things, uh, what's really important here is answering questions like this. You want to know things like, where is this service foo that I need? Uh, how do I talk to it? What's its address? What's its, uh, what's its port? You want to be able to know, you know, is that service healthy? Is it available? Can I even talk to it even if I knew its address? Uh, or should it be healthy and I just can't talk to it? Is it a problem with me or is it a problem with them? Um, what is that service's configuration? So you could know things like, how do I, what are access tokens for it? What features does it support? Is it in maintenance mode? Uh, those sorts of things. And, and part of that is also, what is my configuration? How do I configure myself? And then for some things you want to know, you know, who's the leader or who's the master um, or who should I really be talking to here? And kind of as a, as a meta question for these questions is once you've able to answer those, you know, what happens if the thing that's answering those questions becomes unavailable and goes down? And how do you find that thing? Um, and you know, really as you start thinking about this thing, these things, it gets, uh, you, you run into more and more problems and it's because it's kind of a difficult question to answer correctly. Um, it's easy to solve in, in a stupid way but as you continue to look at it, it gets harder and harder. So now, what I'm, what I'm gonna, the point I'm trying to make here is that actually these questions are very important, uh, a very important part to getting very far in building robust systems. So again, these four questions. For where is service foo, you want to be able to handle a case where maybe it's here, maybe it's very close, or maybe it's on some remote sheen, or maybe it's uh, software as a service, maybe you know, it's not even in our data centers. Is the service healthy and available? You know, yes is the best case because everything's fine. But if it's no, you want to either be able to avoid that service or handle the failure gracefully. For example, in a service-oriented thing, you don't want to wait two seconds on one service that you, we all know is down, or the data center knows is down anyway. You want to be able to basically circuit breaker it off and start ignoring it. Uh, you want to know what the service's configuration again, like uh, I mentioned earlier, basically access information, supported features, enabled, disabled flags. Uh, and you want to be able to set these pretty dynamically. Uh, you want to know what my configuration is. Um, and the most important thing about doing this is you expect the configuration, if you're asking something for it, 
that it would change at runtime. Instead of just reading it from a file and, and assuming that configuration is static forever for all time, uh, you kind of build software in mind knowing that anything can change at any time. Uh, and then finally, yeah, the, who's the leader, who's the master, or really and more generically, who's the best choice? Um, as your infrastructure gets larger, you start running into issues of things like locality. So I would prefer to use a service that's on the same rack as my machines, but if it's not there, I'll take one in the same data center, and if I really, really must, I'll just go cross data center to another one to talk to it. But you'd really prefer to handle things closer than farther, and you want a system to handle this for you. And then the meta question, of course, uh, is, it, is the thing you're a uh, asking highly available or, or stable? Um, and as a critical infrastructure component, you really want this answer to be yes, because if the answer is no, uh, it's very confusing how your infrastructure handles that. Does it keep running until you try to deploy something? Uh, does it start failing because it can't read its own configuration? You don't really know, so ideally you just want this to be yes all the time. And this is, uh, you know, it, you just with these things, you get a good level of robustness. You get something that could find services anywhere, uh, can avoid and handle unhealthy uh, services it depends on, can be configured dynamically, et cetera, and uh, you didn't really have to worry about too much. So now let's get more concrete and show how a system that really exists could help you achieve these things with your services that already exist. So I'm gonna quickly introduce console here and the features that console supports, uh, and then I'll show you actually how you could uh, implement it with your services. So console supports a handful of features, and we're gonna go over each one here. The first one is service discovery. So this answers that question of where is service foo. And the way console does this is exposing it in two ways. One is via DNS, and the other is via a basic HTTP API. So you can see the DNS is really simple. You just ask for the service, um, and it gives you some IP addresses. Uh, and then there's the HTTP API that gives you a little bit more metadata. And What's really nice about this is the DNS is really, really legacy friendly. Um, everything supports DNS. So if you have that application that you don't ever want to redeploy or you don't ever want to change really, DNS is a really good way to do service discovery because it's usually configurable with things you want to talk to anyway. So you just point it to uh, an address and it'll be able to get it. Uh, and the HTTP is there if they, you need rich metadata, but uh, in general I've seen DNS actually gets, gets you 90, 95% of the way there. Uh, another feature console supports is failure detection. So this answers the question, is my service healthy and available? And uh, this is a screenshot of the console web UI where you could see, for example, that, I don't know if you could read it on the screen, yeah, uh, that the web service is, one, one of the web service nodes is failing. Um, but what's really neat is console has this information, gets this information, but also is smart about it. So once a node is failing, or once a node or a service that that, once a service or a node that that service is on is failing, um, the service discovery mechanisms such as DNS and HTTP will not return that address anymore. So uh, it, other services won't try to access it, and if they were already accessing it and it failed, they'll probably try to reconnect, and when they uh, re make that DNS query, they'll get a healthy one in response. Another feature console has is key value storage. So this answers the question is what is the config of some service or what is the config of my service? And this is exposed in a very simple way. Um, you just put some things via HTTP into something and then you request it back out. Very simple. Uh, this storage is highly available. So we talk a little bit more about what makes this highly available a little bit later, but you can be confident that it'll be available in pretty disastrous situations. Um, and what's really nice about this is it allows uh, developers to really turn knobs of configuration without having to invoke big configuration management systems. Um, a lot of services, they try to be configured with, you know, they push the configuration problem off to the configuration management system, um, but I've never actually seen, like, it's very rare to actually see a company where they allow developers to be changing these values. And there's some configs uh, that you do want developers to change values, such as should this feature be de rolled out publicly, should it be rolled out only to developers, you know, those sorts of things. It's easy to do it in this sort of thing, uh, environment. And then the last thing, um, which, you know, not many people reach this problem, but the thing is a lot of service discovery and configuration systems before either completely ignore that this is reality or punt off the problem uh, to the end user, but 
uh, console really makes it a top level feature that it supports multi data center out of the box. And what this means is very simple. So when you're requesting uh, services, you could actually explicitly ask console, you know, give me the web front end in Singapore, or give me the web front end that's in Germany. Um, or you could do it a little bit more broad, which is like, give me the web front end that's local, but if you must, give me it somewhere else in the world. Um, and for the key values as well, you could scope them down uh, on the data center level. So uh, if, you could, if you can't see, uh, one, the top one's requesting the key foo from Asia, and the bottom one is requesting the key foo from the EU. Uh, and this is really nice. So it's local by default because you almost every case just want the local answer. Um, you really don't want to be doing cross WAN uh, communications, but you can query other data centers if you need to. And because console exposes this as a first level you know, feature, you don't have to try to build this in yourself. Um, you, you just have to know the name of the data center. You tell console itself where the other data centers exist, and they handle all the query forwarding or data replication uh, as they need to. And then finally, the meta question, which is, is this data going to be available? What happens in disastrous situations? And uh, unfortunately, 20 minutes isn't enough time in this talk to really go into how, like, deep technical levels of how it assures this for you. Um, but I mean, as a short answer, yes, it's, it's very highly available. So um, one of the ways it achieves this is it uses an agent model. The agents are actually optional, but they're highly recommended. So you install an agent on every server. And you actually ask the agent for things. And the agent is pretty smart about uh, caching data and uh, serving stale data if the servers are unavailable. Um, and on that note, you could also ask console, you know, what's the value for this key? But it must be consistent. You must ask a server. Um, but by default, you know, the agents will be clever about, oh, I can't really talk to the server, but I have this cache, so I'll just give it to you. Um, that helps quite a bit. Uh, and in general, you could read from console during a network partition uh, without issue generally, unless you lost access to all your servers. Um, and writes are replicated to the, the pool of servers and all the servers. Leader elect, so uh, in terms of doing operations, you just take a server, and if you need to upgrade it, you can just shoot it in the face um, and start working on another server, bring it up, and you don't really need to worry about it. So that's what console does. So now let's bring it all together, which is how do we meld these robust systems that answer these questions using console as the answerer of these questions. And in this view of the world, the way to build a robust system is to use the console KV for configuration, console DNS for coupling services together and doing service discovery, and then the console health checks for the monitoring of the services and the nodes that they live on. So for configuration, uh, console has a web interface that answers a lot of questions, but one of the things it has is uh, be, the ability to modify key values. So in this case, uh, you can see that we're editing the desk consumer key in this namespace, and we've, we're setting some value um, and making it available. And then to consume that information without modifying your existing applications, um, we've developed something such as, you could use something like this, which is open source called mconsole. Uh, what mconsole does is actually reads the namespace myappconfig from console, and all the keys in there, it exposes as environmental variables to that sub-application. Um, and that reload flag actually tells it to watch console whenever anything changes to actually gracefully terminate and restart the application. Um, and the, the changes are detected within milliseconds. They're very fast. So this is really nice because you could actually turn knobs and change things in your configuration, and they just propagate across your data center very, very quickly, um, as opposed to if you were using configuration management to manage these specific configs. Um, most configuration management systems are built to run on crons or you know, some periodic 10 minute, half hour sort of intervals. And it's kind of annoying to change maintenance mode to on and then wait half an hour until that becomes available. So yes, mconsole turns KV into environmental variables. And one of the really nice things is you don't need any application changes. A lot of applications use environmental variables for config. And if they don't, you could use something just like mconsole uh, to generate config files and do restarts if you want. Um, so everything's going to use a config file or environmental variable. So that pretty much covers the range. OK. For console DNS, uh, you basically uh, use the DNS uh, for service discovery. So we're going a little bit meta here. We're actually using mconsole to lift, list the environmental variables of some application. Um, which is showing the host, uh, the services it depends on. Uh, but you can see that their values are actually console DNS entries. And yeah, this is super important because, uh, again, no application changes are needed. And the 
application just uses DNS as it normally would to get the answer, and console will only turn the healthy nodes, uh, and so on. And then finally, for the health checks and keeping things, uh, uh, knowing what's failing and what's not failing, you use the, the console health checks. And console health checks are really simple. Uh, I catted a config of what they look like here, but they're just really basic Unix scripts that, you know, return one, it failed, return zero, it's succeeding. Um, they're Nagios compatible, so you can Nagios plugins here. Um, and in this case, we're just using curl. So to test that our web service is working, we just curl uh, every five seconds. And you could see the results of these health checks in the console web UI, so you could actually um, see not only that they're passing and there's a big green banner, but also the uh, output of the latest state change. So uh, if everything's working, the output is actually not updated all the time for scalability reasons, but uh, whenever the state changes from passing to warning or warning to critical or anything uh, in there, it'll change the output so you could see exactly how things are failing. And like I said, these are simple shell scripts. The output's logged. Um, and you are, since it's all built in the console, you get the, the nice coupling, which is where these results will not show up in service discovery if they're failing. And this is super robust. Um, you know, it's not a robust, like definitively robust system, but it's gotten you so far without having to make really any application changes. It's very, very legacy friendly. So with this sort of thing, you could add and remove services kind of at will. Uh, you could reconfigure them using a web interface and get the restart uh, almost instantly. Um, they're using DNS, which is, you know, if, if it fails, they'll just re-query re the thing and it'll, they'll get a response eventually. Um, really nice to just get these, this robustness uh, in your tools. And that is it. Thank you. <laughs>